Sometimes when we are standing around visiting before or after the services, I'll look out over the group, different ones visiting here and there, realizing how many people we have here, for we're not a real large congregation in number. And you can't look anywhere without babies or children. I think that's a marvelous thing. It's, it's great to see people obeying at least one of God's commandments, being fruitful, <laughs> multiplying, and replenishing the earth. Marvelous to have, have young children. Going over to the Old Testament in the book of Haggai, we want to set out what we want to study for a little while this morning with you. Haggai is called one of those post-exilic, that is after the exile in Babylonian captivity, prophets. In fact, he's the first one of them. And when you go into the book, we're certainly not going to study the whole book, but there are four prophecies that are delivered, and they're delivered within about four months. And this is about 15 years after the return of the first exiles to Jerusalem. Work, and this is an important point I want us to notice, work on the second temple had begun shortly after the exiles had arrived back in Judea. Then the prophet comes, Haggai, with a series, as I said, um, prophecies, very timely, vigorous messages. And they challenge the people. Well, challenging them to do what? To with a whole heart, enter into the work and the great task of rebuilding the house of God. And Haggai is quite severe at times with these people because they're just like you and me as to the overworked words are getting our priorities straight. So I want you to notice what he says as we begin reading here in Haggai. He dates himself in the way they did at that time by saying in the first verse, in the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time's not come. The time that the Lord's house should be built. Well, God inspired him to say this. God knows the hearts of men. So that's the attitude they had. They'd been there 15 years. And they started building it not long after they came. But 15 years have passed. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet. Saying, because this is in response to the disposition of mind they had. Is it time for you... O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste. Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts. You know, God has to get us to think and to really see ourselves as we are. And he says, consider your ways. Some people don't do that because they've considered them just enough to know they don't want to know any more. But he says, consider your ways. Well, their ways is, has been built on what we noticed earlier. The people say the time's not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. In verse 6, notice what he says they're doing. They haven't got the priorities straight. You've sown much and bring in little. Ye eat, but you have not enough. Ye drink. But you're not filled with drink. Ye clothe you. But there's none warm. Then notice this. And he that earneth wages. Earneth wages to put it into a bag. 
with holes. I'm sure all of us have had a hole in our pocket sometimes and we've dropped some change in it or something's been there and it's fallen out. Usually it's something you really think you need. Pocket knife that we've had a long time or keys. And uh, we miss something like that. We thought we had it secure. We thought we had it in the right place. But there's a hole in it. Now why would this prophet, son of God, to speak directly to this attitude that says the time's not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Why would he say this to them? They got the priorities wrong. They've built themselves houses. He says they're sealed houses. These are nice houses. They're not just adobe. Uh, but 15 years have passed since you started the temple, and where is it? So thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Notice as he reasons with them, we come down to the latter part of verse 9. And we'll read the beginning of it to set the thing. You looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I, I did blow upon it. Notice how God says it's easy for me to take care of matters. I just blow upon it. Saith the Lord of hosts. Now listen, here's why you're in the mess you're in. Here's why you don't have, though you work hard. Because of mine house that is waste. And ye run every man unto his own house. Have people changed? You know, he, I say, is a good prophet to the American people and to the church existent in America today. Fifteen long years before. Not long after they came out of 70 years of captivity. And why were they in the captivity? Because for hundreds of years they would not heed the prophets, nor the law, nor live according to what they promised to do. And especially running after idolatry and all the sins that accompanied it. And so finally, after hundreds of years of rebellion, God sent them to 70 years of captivity. Well, you won't find them with the problem of idolatry anymore. That doesn't mean they were not without sin. And here's one of the greatest challenges to the spiritual house of God today. To the members of the church who make it up. It's still so very easy to take care of ourselves while the spiritual house of God, the church, the kingdom of the Lord, the temple of God, meaning a place of worship. God receives worship from those who make up that spiritual temple, the Christians in it, the priests, for we're all priests as Christians. We're very busy about things that we have to do. We often complain because of the work we have to do that's peculiar to Christians, and God has elected us out of all other people, sanctified us in our belief and obedience to the gospel to do that work. There's a work that the church is to do that nobody else is to do because we have believed the gospel. We have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine, being then made free from sin. Now notice what he says we become. When we rise from that watery grave of baptisms, our sin remitted, the Lord adding this to the church. We're servants of righteousness, bond slaves to righteousness by our own choice. Well, all of God's commandments are righteousness, Psalms 119, verse 172. And when we were raised the watery grave of baptism, a new creature in Christ, old sins passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And the great new thing is that we're servants of God by serving righteousness, thus complying with his will. No wonder Paul would say, you're not your own. You are bought with a price. And thus, what does he conclude from that? We should therefore do those things that glorify God. And I'll just put the B right down on all of us. Every one of us will always need it. In your own lives, in your own planning, and most of it centers around the flesh. Let's just face it, that's the way it is. It just centers around the flesh and taking care of the flesh. How much have you invested into that? And how much have you invested into the work of the Lord? And of course, we all know the houses we live in now are ones we may have in the future. We'll all be in 50 years from now, won't we? Still enjoying and planning to build another one. Now, there's nothing wrong with building a house. I'm not saying that. You've got to have a place to live. That's not what he's saying. He's not saying, he is not condemning these people for building them a nice house. You, if that's what you get out of this, you need to go back and refocus. 
He's saying something should have come first. And they didn't. It's just that way. Their interest was here and 15 long years after returning from captivity, which was their own punishment in disobeying God, the house wasn't finished. Now today, we build the house of God through living righteous lives and teaching the truth and seeking to convert others and growing our knowledge and practice of the truth, being the salt of the earth, the light of the world. God is concerned about the money you've got in your bank account and what you do with it, being that you wear the name Christian. The church, to do its work, is going to have to have money. Now you may think the elders asked me to do this, but they didn't. I haven't preached on this a long time. And there never is a time that it won't hurt any of us or that it will hurt us to think about what God's blessed us with materially, whether it's great or small. Everything we have comes from Him, the Father of lights, in whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Whatever you've got that's good came from God. You may think, well, I did it. No. You may have done what was necessary to get it, but you could have done what was necessary to get it and God hadn't blessed you, you wouldn't have it. Listen to this. We move from there and go over into Mark chapter 12, verses 41 through 44, many years later. Now, you know what's interesting? Herod, to get favor with those Jews, starting rebuilding and remodeling a great, great building project. Years and years were in the making, and at this time, that the Lord's in His ministry, and at the time what we're about to read here, the uh, temple was still being worked on. In fact, it wouldn't be completely finished until about 40 years before the Romans destroyed the whole thing. And I've often thought, and we know very well about this, in Matthew 24, when the Lord leaves the temple for the last time, He's really delivered some scathing rebukes to those hypocrites that He left there. The apostles are still showing Him the building of the temple and how marvelous and beautiful they are. And what does Jesus say? See not all these things? There shall not be here left one stone upon another which shall not be thrown down. You should go back and start from the days of David when he wanted, as he said, to build a house for the Lord. God wouldn't let him because he had been a warrior and a fighting man and shed so much blood but David said, well, I can't do it because God had said, your son will when he sits on the throne. He said, I'll just get everything together so he'll have it here to, to put it together. And if you read about all that, you'll see what happens, what all goes on with it. But in this account, and there have been many sermons just based upon this, Jesus is in the temple. And the scripture says in verse 41 of Mark 12, and Jesus sat over against the treasury. I wonder why he say why he didn't say he didn't set out among the people. Why doesn't he stand in the door? Uh, why doesn't he do this, that? He sets over against the treasury. Now, let me make a point. He still sets over against the treasury. What does he do sitting there? And beheld how the people cast money into the treasury. And many that were rich cast in much. Why is this in your Bible when you read it? What does it say to you about what you have, little or great? Is Jesus not doing this now as he searches your mind with you regarding what you have and your planning and purposing to give? And there came a certain poor widow. Remember, the rich people are giving a lot. You would expect that, wouldn't you? And there came a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which make a farthing. Folks, that's not a penny. In our money today, and our money today is not worth much as far as a penny is concerned. In fact, they're talking about not even having it around. But notice what he does. And he called unto him his disciples, and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast more in than all they which have cast into the treasury. For all they did cast in their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. Mark 12, 41 through 44. 
Is this take up space? Is there something there God's saying to you and to me about what possessions he has put into our charge? Do we not realize we're stewards over whatever it is that we have? That is, we're taking care of somebody else's business, not our own. And if we do that rightly, we do it according to his will. It's easy to give, at least for some, quite a bit of money when you've got a whole lot of money and you won't miss it. It doesn't mean that money won't do people good. It, it will. But what about the person that gives it? I belong to the Lord. What does that imply about my life? We preach often, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Mark 6, 33. And if you look in the context of it, lo and behold, Jesus is talking about being anxious over possession of material things and being worried about not having the money to do this. We talk about contributing our best to the Lord. That's good. We're not interested at this time in just our physical appearance, but we're talking about our reasonable service to God, Romans 12 and verse 1. That is our complete dedication to God and doing things His way. We, we need to give, we know, the best when it comes to planning our time. That means our best efforts to God. We need also then to support the church in doing God's work in this contributing of our means. We are approached daily, all of us are, via telephone, TV ads, mail, every kind of solicitation to support everything. Orphans, the police, fire department, the schools, many of them are good works. But now being a Christian, a member of the Lord's church, sanctified, meet for the master's service, not belong to yourself, but belong to the Lord, a steward of the things God has given you, where do you think we should be giving when we give first, foremost, and always? What should take precedence? when it comes to our planning to give what we have. If it's not the kingdom of the Lord, then you've got to explain to the Lord why all these other things are more important than that. There are many good works that are done and that are supported by a voluntary contribution. And the support the Lord wants in whatever material you have to give to Him, He wants it to be voluntary. Too often we are distracted by the world's causes and we begin to think of uh, the church as just one more good doing organization that needs money. That's wrong thinking. I can't really understand how a person can know what the New Testament teaches about being a Christian, what all that implies, and that one would think that way. But I do know this, that if you want to see really what people are made of, just start dealing with money. There's been a host of families who have gotten along very well till mom and daddy died and the will was read and there's been people fall out right and left then. Why? Money. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So what I do goes through my heart. These folks back in the prophet's day had it in their heart to take care of themselves before they took care of of building the temple. I want you to notice that Paul deals with this in 2 Corinthians. Of course, he sets out, and we'll notice this in a moment, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, but he gets more into attitudes and viewpoints and what that means in your life when it comes to contributing of your means to the Lord. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10 through 15. He's writing to the Corinthians. He's reminded them of the poor Macedonians and how they gave so much of their means, far more than he expected, and he even tried to talk them out of it, but they wouldn't do it. And so he says to the Corinthians, verse 9, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Stop right there. Grace is favor. You know how Christ has favored you. You didn't deserve it, but he did it for you. He favored you. That though he was rich, not just how rich is Christ. How are you going to measure the riches of God? That though he was rich, yet for your sakes, he became poor. 
And that was for a reason. That ye through his poverty might be rich. You know, there's a strange view here. A man with wealth, wealth unthought of, untold as far as God, he gave it all up to save men who really didn't deserve it. Now, we're the spiritual body of Christ and members in particular, and if we're Christians, we know how we became Christians. We know what that implies about our decisions, our thinking, our planning, the use of our life. We're living sacrifices. That's our reasonable service, Paul says. Sacrifice means this is important to me, but I'm giving it up for the Lord. I wish we would dwell more on the real meaning of sacrifice. We use the word a lot, but it means this is important. I need it. I enjoy it. I work for it. Now what am I going to do with it? I'm going to give it up for the cause of Christ. He says, verse 10, and herein I give my advice, for this is expedient, it's advantageous for you, you Corinthian brethren, who have begun before not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. So it sounds like many hundreds of years later, they got a bit of the problem the folks had building the temple. They said, what you're asking, Paul, and teaching is a worthy thing, and we're behind it 100%. One month passes, two months passes, three months passes, five, six, ten, eleven, finally a year. Paul writes them and said, you did a great thing in promising to give. Now, where's the money? Now, therefore, perform the doing of it. That's what Haggai said to these folks. You took care of yourself. You got these fine sealed houses, and you run to them. But look at the Lord's temple and think of the significance and place of that temple under the Mosaic economy. Now, therefore, perform the doing of it, that as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which ye have. In other words, the Lord's not expecting you to give what you don't have. But the Macedonians had given far beyond what even Paul, I imagine the sacrificial life of Paul, what even Paul thought they were able to give. And here's why. It's said in, in verse 12, For if there be first a willing mind, the battle to live faithful starts first in the mind. And if that battle is won there, the rest follows right along. For if there be first a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. For I mean not that other men be eased and ye burdened, but by an equality that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, that their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that ye may be equality. As it is written, he that had gathered much had nothing over, and he that had gathered a little had no lack. If he's not saying you've got to get your priorities right, much overworked term, but a good one, when he's applied right, then what would he have the right to say? These people heard the gospel. They believed it. They obeyed the gospel. He's not saying you need to become Christians. He's saying you need to understand what it is to be one when it comes to your money. That's what it gets down to. Notice I said your money. Your money. My money. My house. My car. But we're said to be living sacrifices. That is, our life is rendered to God to live it on His terms. And that's our reasonable service. You can see the disposition of mind that's set out by Paul to the church in Philippi. Now, that's a Macedonian church, folks. That would be one of those churches he uses as an example of the Corinthians. Corinth was rich. Philippi wasn't. Or none of the churches of Macedonia. In chapter 4 of the Philippian letter, verses 15 through 18, Paul says very plainly, Now ye Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving. Watch it. But ye only. That pretty well means that he had the Philippians certainly in mind when he wrote to the Corinthians and used them as an example of giving. For even in Thessalonica, ye sent once and again under my vacation account. He says, to my necessity. They were contributing to what he needed. Not because I desire a gift, 
but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. People have never learned that when they give with the disposition of mind the Bible teaches as a Christian, and as we're studying now, that's a blessing to you. There's something wrong with somebody when in their life, they have not had the opportunity to rejoice because of something they good for some, did for somebody else and that person couldn't do it. I think probably the, the greatest rejoicing and warm thoughts I've had is to do something for somebody else. They couldn't do it for themselves. It needed to be done. And there's a joy in that. Now you know why the Hebrews writer said of the Christ concerning the ordeal of Gethsemane and especially the cross that for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. You know how we might bring that down today? For the joy, that which we're going to accomplish, for the joy that's set before us, we write a bigger check. Now that gets it right down to where it ought to be. I want to ask you, how much has any of us ever given when you compare what the Lord gave? Should we not be challenged? Is there ever a time... That we can say, I'm giving all I need to give, I'll never need to give anymore. I promise you, if you really believe that, you don't matter to anything as far as you're good in the church, and you're going to go backwards in apostasy rather than forward in growth and development in the likeness of Christ. So Paul says that to the church there, it's in the New Testament of the Christ, it's written to you and written to me. Will we receive it? We have to have attitudes that are appropriate. Notice there must be a, a willing spirit. There must be the need seen. There must be the desire to live on the level of the truth. So there are attitudes that must be there, proper attitudes in giving. You have to prepare to do so. Woe be to the person that gets in and says, Oh, contribution coming up. Fip through there and grab some money and throw it in. You, you, haven't, you haven't participated like you ought to. That's not worship in spirit. Not even in truth. You need to prepare. Notice 2 Corinthians 8, 11 through 12 again. A readiness or willingness to give. A readiness or willingness to give implies preparation on your part and examination of what you have. Do you ever really take close scrutiny of that? Sometimes we talk about preparing a budget. I mentioned to a young couple the other day, thinking about getting married, how Jody and I on that great preacher's plate we got, uh, sat down and actually made out a budget. We took every penny that we got and we knew pretty well what would come in each month. You know, you got regular bills. They're pretty much the same every month. And we made a column. And this was for groceries. And this was for utilities. And this was this, that, and the other. And there was a column there to give to the Lord. I just had the dumb idea that if you pay utilities, you ought to give something to the Lord. <laughs> and I say that sarcastically to make a point. There has to be the readiness to give. You you need to see yourself as you really are, and I mean that as God sees you, and take out the money that you're getting, sit down and say, here's what I'm giving to this, to this, to this, to this, to this. Now here's what I'm giving to the church. Now there's some comparing and contrasting. He'll tell the Corinthians here that they are to grow in this grace also. Because he uses the word grace or favor in the sense that you do a favor to other people when you give to the Lord for the reasons Christians will give to the Lord. So in our giving, we're expected to grow. Have you grown your Bible knowledge? Have you grown in prayer? Have you grown in understanding other areas of work in the church and participating in the five acts of worship on the first day of the week in teaching a class and being a better husband and wife, whatever? Well, then you can grow in giving. And there has to be a way that you measure those things. And if you haven't done it in quite a while, what is that about the chili commercial? It's probably been too long. How do you measure things? How do you take stock of your spirituality? And if you don't think what you possess and how you use it for the Lord is a, help, a big measure of your spirituality, you need to go back and start with the first principles of the oracles of God. A readiness or willingness to give, 2 Corinthians 8 through 11. Or 11 through 12. Then in 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2, you, you're aware of that. That is a proof text and rightly used for that concerning our giving on the first day of the week. But, but look at it. It is that. It is giving on the first day of the week. But it says something else. 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. Now concerning the collection for the saints. 
I'm going to tell you, I'm going to give you orders like I did the church of Galatia. As I have given order to the church of Galatia, see, even so do ye. On the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him that there be no gatherings when I come. How do you know what to, as we say, put in the plate, make the amount of your contribution, if you don't take stock of things the week before? If you don't purpose, you don't will, you don't plan, you don't examine. How do you know? And then you stop, and what you'll see if you don't watch out is how much money I'm putting over here to burn up with the world and how much I'm putting into the church. It goes on eternally. Because the Lord had a lot to say about laying up treasure on earth for moth and rust doth corrupt and thieves and the breaking of the stock market in flash and break, inflation breaks through and steal. Think about this. You're going to lose money in the stock market. Why don't you go ahead and give it to the church before you lose it? You're not going to have it anyway. And think about that. I've got $50,000 in the stock market. I'm scared to death it's going to take a nosedive. It's been doing that. It's very volatile. And lo and behold, it goes by, and I look, and I'm, I'm, I'm $8,000 down. Now, if you were scared of that and knowing the stock market well enough, why didn't you just go ahead and give that $8,000 to the church? Is that stupid reasoning? Is that unheard of? Is that being idiotic? Why is it? <laughs> Why is it? I use the stock market business, not because everybody's in the stock market, but because that's, that's just a good place to illustrate what we're doing. But if we invest in the cause of Christ, the dividend is going to pay, and the day we stand before the Lord in judgment cannot be measured. Warren Buffett, I don't care how much he's got. How smart he is in the stock market, making money. How honestly he makes it. How much he's got at his disposal. The person who gets to heaven and what they will receive in the rewards of glory there is so far beyond that that there's no way to compare and contrast it. We just need to be more spiritual in our outlook. We're trying to live here on earth and plan everything like we're always going to be here. We are to purpose, 2 Corinthians 9, 7. I mentioned that. We should be happy to be able to give. We're commanded not to give grudgingly. Well, i got to do this, so here it is. That's sinful. It's a new and you good. You do that, and you'll lose your soul. It should be a liberal distribution. If you look at verse 13 of 2 Corinthians 9, you'll see that very point made. Whilst by the experiment of this ministration they glorify God for your professed subjection of the gospel of Christ and for your liberal distribution unto them and unto all men. Now he's ending up his discussion in the second epistle to the church in Corinth after he's laid out the Lord's giving, what motivated him to give, and what he gave up, and then these Macedonians who had little in contrast to what the Corinthians had and said, this is the way it works. You see, if I don't think this way, I'm telling something about myself, folks. I'm saying I haven't grown much spiritually if I don't think this way. And yet, aren't we to think on the truth of God, revealed in the words of God concerning our conduct, that we can live like Christ? Isn't that what it's all about, to grow up in Christ? So the gift should be a generous one. And the Macedonians certainly did that. In fact, they gave beyond their power, which is authorization to even go beyond giving when the need arises from giving just as you've been prospered. And the need has arisen, and Paul said they gave beyond their power. So we give as we've been prospered cheerfully without grudging, but when certain things come up, we'll even give more than that. In 2 Corinthians 8, 12, we read that. We're to give what we have, and I emphasize it again. As we've been prospered, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2. And then Acts 11 and 29, you'll see the relief they sent down there, as he's talking about it here in the Corinthian epistle, was according to their ability. We sing the song sometimes, if just a cup of water, what do we mean there? Is placed within your hand? Then just a cup of water is all that I demand. I assure you, in this building, we have far more than one cup of water. 
just a matter of where we're putting the water. Some of us are putting that water into a place that's going to burn when the elements melt with fervent heat. We won't profit from it. We won't even really profit from it here in this world. But there's a way you can, whether you have little or much or anywhere in between, investing in the Lord's work. The responsibility to give is not based on income. Of course, the amount should reflect your income because you're giving as you've been prospered. And Luke 16, 10 through 12, we learn that a poor person who's not generous will not be generous if he becomes rich. What I will do with my dollar or five dollars is what I would do with my five thousand or five million. You may not think that to be the case, but you're still you. And whether good traits or bad traits, the amount of money you receive that's in your hand will be used accordingly. Now, another thing as we end the lesson, your gift should cost you something. Written aforetime for our learning with the Old Testament accounts, and in 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 24, David looked for a place, getting ready for Solomon to build the temple, to buy a threshing floor. And when the king came and the man who owned it saw that he wanted it, I'll just give it to you. Well, that sounds good. That's commendable to that person. But David then said, I will not give the Lord that which cost me nothing. David understood the impact of sacrificial giving on his own spiritual growth and development. Some of us don't. Generosity cannot be measured, of course, by the size of the gift. We see that with the widow who gave all she had, though it was but two mites. The question is, how much do you keep of what God has given you? That's really where it is. We want to start anywhere. How much do you keep of what God's given you? Now, you received a paycheck sometime recently. You might have received something else of physical worth. Do you really think of your own power? Do you receive that? Or did God give it to you? We're to give in our regular worship on the first day of the week, 1 Corinthians 16, 2. We've talked about that, but that's not the only time we're authorized to give. Matthew 5, 42 says I can give somebody ask when they need. And Galatians 6, 10 says we have opportunity to do good unto all men, especially those households of faith. So you see, what we plan to give regularly on the first day of the week doesn't even all cover all the areas which we're to give. We often say that the law of Moses, and correctly so, was a much uh, more limited and less important for what it could do for the salvation of man, law than the law of Christ or the gospel. And that's right. But have you ever studied every law that pertained to what the Jew used to give? And you'll find he was giving upwards of a third or more of his income every year. And that was for a law that doesn't measure up, if you read Hebrews, to the better covenant of Jesus Christ. That should say something. God gave to us first. Now, let me ask you this. If God had given to us on the basis of how we give to him, would we be saved? If God had given to us on the basis of how we give to him, would we be saved from our sins and would we have the hope of eternal salvation? Would there be a gospel? It is God who created us. It is God who made the world. It is God who gave us all the opportunities to work. How many people are living in this world outside of the United States? But you were blessed to be born in the United States. Or, as you say about Texas, you got here as soon as you could. Now, there's a reason for that. That is, you got here as soon as you could. Because you think there are blessings here that wouldn't be somewhere else. But God's therefore allowed you by his good mercy and grace to be born in this country. Why weren't you born in India? And would you be in India what you are here? or China, or Russia, or outer Mongolia. But God put you here. Do you think then that he will require more of you because of the favor that he bestowed upon you in putting you here and allowing you to have what you have? If you say, no, he won't do that, on what grounds would you make a statement like that? If you look at the nature of the judgment day, you will see... That yes, we're judged by the standard, the absolute objective standard of truth that is the New Testament system for us living today. But there's another element in that judgment. That's just the standard. The other element in it is as we have had opportunity, what did we do with that opportunity? We don't think about that much. We just say, well, we're judged by the truth. You've got to be obedient to the truth. But every man on this earth doesn't have the opportunity. Every other man does. 
to find the Lord, to be exposed to good things. And woe be to the person in this United States that dies and goes to hell. But more than that, woe be to the member of the church who does so because we have been blessed with opportunities that throughout the history of this world no man has ever known. And we see that when it comes to the government being challenged and the Constitution and the way people are living morally. Well, what about us and the church living here where God graced us to live? Does it not apply to us too? Be careful lest we need a beam pulled from our own eyes that we might be better able to see the moat that's in somebody else's eye who doesn't even know the gospel at all. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 28, we're taught a crazy view from the world's perspective. We are actually to work and get gain so we can give it away for the good and the needs of others. Isn't that amazing? I'm going to be rich. Well, why? I want to give a whole lot to other people. Well, what is rich? I'm not going to go into that. I've got $5,000, and another fellow has none. I'm rich. My $5,000 doesn't mean much to the fellow. When I estimate who's rich, it's got a million. And the fellow with a million, but he looks at the fellow with 50. The fellow with 50, he looks at the fellow with 500. The fellow with 500 yearns to be like Warren Buffett. <laughs> so rich is a relative thing. God gave us his own son. What have you given? He purchased our salvation with the blood of Christ. Have you benefited from that? Well, surely we have. His blood cleanses us from our sins. Now, what does that mean I should be doing with what I have? How trivial and insignificant when really you consider whatever we give to him in view of what he's given to us. Now, here's the closing point. God rewards the giver. He doesn't reward the person that doesn't. Take giving out of Christianity and it goes. It's gone. Remember? Paul says in Romans 12, 1 and 2, that our reasonable service is to serve him, to give him, to use our bodies doing his will. Generosity is going to be returned at a later time. Ecclesiastes 1 verse 11 makes that clear. The generous will prosper, Proverbs 11 and verse 25. As we give, it will be returned, Luke 6, 38. As we sow... So shall we harvest, 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 10. And the cycle continues. The gifts we give bring glory to God when we do them with the right disposition of heart on the basis of the instruction of the Scriptures. And that's exactly what Paul says to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, and verse 10. This has been a general study of giving. There's the giving to God through the church. There's the giving to God through our aid to our fellow man. And Hebrews 13, 16 makes it clear. Do not neglect you're giving. So I'm pleading with all of you, I haven't preached on this in a while, to do some checking. You accountants to do some checking of the accounts. All of you be accountants for God relative to what he's placed in your hand and say, am I following this teaching of Matthew 6.33 when it comes to what I give to the Lord? Then when you leave the day, go home. When you bow your head to thank God, which we will back here in a moment, for the food we have, think about what you can give, what you ought to give, and that giving is a measure of your faith and your spirituality. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we beg you to believe in Christ, repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be baptized for the remission of your sins by the authority of Christ. If you've done that, but you've erred, in fact, your life has committed in your life sins that brought reproach on the Lord's church. You need to humbly repent of those sins, come confessing them, and we'll pray with you and for you that your sins be forgiven. If you're subject to the Lord's call, then we ask you to come while we stand and sing.